Hello and good morning to all dignitaries, guests and delegates. Great joy and immense pleasure. With warm greetings, I would like to extend my heartiest welcome to one and all assemble here on this very auspicious occasion in a very spectacular morning. Welcome to the one week online international faculty development program under the UGC Paramar scheme on first screen digital co competencies in academic landscape organized by the internal quality assurance cell of MES College Marambali in association with the Kerala Higher Education Council. Warm welcome. Thank you for joining us. MES College Marambali is an institution of higher education which is affiliated to the Mahatma Gandhi University. The college has been re-accredited by the National Assessment and Accreditation Council of India with an A plus grade and also with a CGPA of 3.38, which is the first ever highest grade in the state as per the revised process of accreditation. MES College Marampalli has also been awarded the Menta Institution status as part of the Parmars scheme of the UGC. The main objective of this mentoring is to provide direction and guidance to the NAC accreditation aspirant institutions and also to promote quality assurance in higher education. So our international FDP will continue for six consecutive days with one session per day. And we are also very happy to announce that we've got eminent resource persons to chair each session. So let's hope for the best and uh, thank you everybody for joining us. So without any further ado, let's get straight into the program. It's a mark of our undying tradition to invoke the almighty at the beginning of any event. Just like the great philosopher said, the function of prayer is not to influence God, but rather to change the nature of a man who prays. Let me now invite Ms. Aradi from Final Year BSc Electronics for the prayer session. Please, Aradi. Ayi tudangu min bhasha, amma illunarum musneham. Ayi tudangu min bhasha. அம்மையில் உணரும் ஸ்நேகம் அறிவுகள் பகருமே தத்தியாபகர் தணலாய் நிறையும் நிதச்சன் இன்னே தளராதே காக்கும் தெய்வம் ஆயில் துடங்கும் என் பாஷா அம்மையில் உணரும் ஸ்நேகம் அறிவுகள் பகருமே தத்தியாபகர் தணலாய் நிறையும் நிதச்சன் நம்மை தளராதே காக்கும் தெய்வம் மாதா பிதா குரு தெய்வம் மாதா பிதா குரு தெய்வம் மாதா பிதா குரு தெய்வம் Thank you, Arudi. Thank you so much for creating a peaceful atmosphere over here. Thank you. And feeling blessed indeed. Thank you so much. Let me now invite Dr. Jasmine PM, IQSC coordinator, MES College Marampalli, for the welcome address. Please, ma'am. Thank you, Selva. Good morning, Manandor. Respected principal and president of the program, Dr. Mansur Ali PP. Most respected chief guest of the day, Dr. Rajan Kurikal, opening speaker, Dr. Murali Tumarugudi, chairman of the college managing committee, Mr. M. A. Muhammad, secretary advocate A. A. Abul Hassan, standing committee members of Paramash, principals of Mindy Colleges, staff secretary, Ms. Lina C. Shekhar, program coordinator, Ms. Sufaira, dear colleagues and participants. A warm welcome to all of you. Today is an auspicious day for IQAC MES College Marampalli since we are organizing an international FDP on fostering digital core competencies in academic landscape in association with the Kerala State Higher Education Council under UGC Paramar scheme for mentoring NAC accreditation aspirant institutions to promote quality assurance in higher education. Professional digital competency is an integral part of teachers' professional development. A few years back, the advancements in the technology we witness today seemed far out of reach. Yet we stand here today constantly evolving and pushing the envelopes to new boundaries. 
As we know, the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated this paradigm shift. It has pushed us back to the world, forcing to dig deep and find solutions to problems humankind never faced before. Teaching and learning have been one area most affected by the pandemic, but thanks to the technology that responded majestically. Well-crafted learning management systems have been in use to set up ICT-enabled innovative management systems have been in use to set up ICT-enabled innovative environments to carry out teaching and learning effectively post the pandemic. The students and teachers need to be equipped with the right technology at their disposal to tap the full potential of ICT-enabled learning management systems. It is in this context the International FDP on fostering digital core competencies in academic landscape assumes importance. We are sure that the sessions handled by allied scholars in the span of a week will help a now user to master the digital platforms used widely in the education sector. With this introduction, let me move on to my duty. This FDP is conducted under the leadership of our beloved principal, Dr. Mansoor Ali PB. Even in his busy schedule, he is always with us, extending all the support in organizing this program. Without his proper guidance, this program would not be a reality. On behalf of this FDP, I extend a warm welcome to you, sir. Today, we are honored with the presence of Dr. Rajan Kurikal, Vice Chairman of Kerala State Higher Education Council. He is a man who needs no introduction. He is a leading Indian social scientist, historian, professor, and writer. Despite his busy schedule, he accepted our invitation and joined with us. On behalf of MES College Marambali and IQSC, I am really happy to welcome you, sir, to this function. The opening session of the FDP is by an international personality, Dr. Murili Tumarugudi, who is working as operations manager at the crisis management branch of United Nations Environment Program, Geneva. He is handling the session from Geneva and now it is only 5.30 a.m. there. Though he is always busy with various activities, he has consented to be the opening speaker. On behalf of MES College Marambali, I extend a warm welcome to you, sir. The reason why our college is at such a prosperous stage is because of our progressive management. The support extended by our management committee members, especially from Mr. M.A. Mohammed, Chairman and Advocate A.A. Abul Hassan, Secretary is endless. On behalf of IQSC of MES College Marambani, I welcome you sirs to this program. Next, I would like to welcome all the standing committee members principals and IQSC coordinators of many institutions. Ms. Lena C. Shager, Staff Secretary, is always there to support us in all the activities. On behalf of IQSC, I extend a warm welcome to you, ma'am. The one-week faculty development program is coordinated by Ms. Sufaira Shamsuddin and is supported by all the IQSC members. On my personal behalf, I welcome you all to this function. We have more than 600 registrations from within and outside the state. On behalf of MES College Marambali, I extend a warm welcome to all the participants. I welcome all my colleagues at MES College Marambali to this program. Once again, I extend a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you, have a nice day. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for your earnest welcome address. And now I would like to invite our beloved principal of MES College, Marambali, Dr. Manzur Ali Pipi, for the presidential address. Please, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Selva. Very good morning, one and all. It is indeed a great day for MES College, Marambali, as we are witnessing an international faculty development program organized by Internal Quality Assurance Cell of MES College Marambali for the Mendi Institution and also the faculty members across the nation. And I am glad to see that there are more than 600 registration and they are attending this particular program. Uh, eminent scholar and vice chairman of Kerala State Higher Education Council, Professor Rajan Gurukal, sir. Uh, Dr. Tumaru Kudi, he will be joining by 9.20 because his first session starts by 9.30. And chairman of 
the college M. A. Muhammad Sir, Secretary Advocate Abul Hassan, IQAC Coordinator Dr. Jasmine, uh, Principals and IQAC Coordinators of our Mendi Institution and uh, Staff Secretary uh, Lina C. Shaker and uh, the coordinator of this International Faculty Development Program, Ms. Sufaira Shamsuddin, all other uh, fellow colleagues of IQAC members, and my dearest participants from the uh, neighboring institution, a very good morning to one and all. It's given me uh, immense pleasure to preside the IQAC organized five days faculty development program. And that too, on the topic, fostering digital core competencies in academic landscape under the University Grants Commission Parama scheme in association with Kerala State Higher Education Council. And I wanted to share, you know, a joy with you. One of our Mindy institution is facing peer team visit of NAC uh, today and tomorrow. So as uh, rightly pointed by the IQAC coordinator of MES College, Marambadi, Dr. Jasmine, we are witnessing unprecedented transformation in every sphere, which has heavily impacted the education sector too. We can see, you know, every day we can see a full page uh, newspaper advertisement on edutech companies and, uh, you know, all other advertisement is heavily on the education. And uh, most of us are getting one or two or three or calls on, you know, from the ed education sector, uh, edutech companies. So we can see that the repercussions of disruptive technology is now a reality. And the question is, how we can prepare ourselves as, you know, the faculty members and our students for a world such an unprecedented transformation, though, uh, you know, it is compulsive due to the pandemic and what skill sets we need to sustain and thus to navigate the maze of life. And that's, a, uh, you know, the question of the hour. And we can see that the national education policy implemented in 2020 and a couple of, a couple of weeks, uh, you know, before they had an analysis on the NEP implementation and there had one or two projects came out and it has you know, it had a heavy discussion among the academia. It was on academic bank of credit, ABC, and other one was blended learning. So how we are equipped as faculty members in these kind of, you know, uh, you know, concepts, technologies in education sector. So that's the focus of this faculty development program. And we can see that, uh, you know, all the uh, resource person associated with the faculty development program is eminent uh, scholars, luminaries, uh, you know, in the education sector, and which is, you know, uh, associated, this particular FDP is associated with the Kerala State Higher Education Council, and head of the Higher Education Council is inaugurating uh, the eminent scholar and, you know, a guiding force of Kerala higher education sector, uh, Professor Rajan Gurutal, sir. We have been associated with him for many programs. Uh, indeed, IQAC previously in the last year associated uh, the same UGC Paramash team, and this time he's inaugurating this particular FDP. And uh, we are blessed to have you have you with us, sir. And also, Dr. Tumarugudi will be joined from Geneva by 9:20 with us. And uh, we are blessed to have you in this platform. And on behalf of Personal Note and also MES College Marambali, I once again welcome you, sir. And uh, I take this opportunity to congratulate the IQAC, Internal Quality Assurance Cell, headed by Dr. Jasmine. And there, there is a you know, very uh, you know, established team. They are organizing this particular faculty development program. I appreciate all of them. And though uh, you know, there is a transformation from the uh, teachers to smart teachers, I believe in the words of you know, Walt Soinga, he is the first African Nobel laureate. Though, you know, there is a disconnect, there is a chance for disconnect between the learner and teacher, but uh, I believe that no technology can, you know, depart the uh, attachment between a learner and also a teacher. Uh, with this, I conclude. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your support and thank you for being the pillar of strength for us always. Thank you so much. 
So now we are moving on to the inaugural ceremony, and it's my honor to invite Professor Dr. Rajan Gurukal, Vice Chairman, Kerala State Higher Education Council, for the inaugural address. Please, sir, over to you. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are. Yes, uh, respected principal, Dr. Mansoor Ali, other college authorities, guests, Dr. Murali, resource persons, IQAC coordinator, and my dear students. Good morning, all of you. It's immensely gratifying to associate myself with the Marambali College in its attempt at organizing an international faculty development program. And uh, I am extremely happy that I have given a chance to be part of this. As you all know, the higher education sector is undergoing a radical and fundamental change. Although many of us haven't taken it as a major transformation. The State Higher Education Council recognized the gravity of the transformation and understood the underlying and significant component to cope with the transformation. And switching a college over to digital technology. It's not merely going online with which all colleges have been familiar for more than a year now due to COVID-19 closed down and then various impediments. A digital enablement is about helping institutions cope with a major transformation in teaching and learning and also conducting the institution as a whole. It's a de facto transformation, as I have already mentioned. It's changing the entire concept, design, operation, function, role, and responsibility of higher education institutions, <coughs> sorry, teachers and students. Higher education institutions are now expected to become entrepreneurial establishments operating on enterprise resource planning that enables to improve service, increase transparency, and enhance efficiency through the life cycle management of the clientele consisting of teachers and students from their entry to exit. Colleges and universities are required to provide a digitally equipped environment for teaching and learning. I am sure that as already uh, announced by the principal, that the college is well set in, in these grounds. But I, I just <clears throat> report that the role of the institution is totally different now 
as the role of the teachers and then the responsibility of students. <clears throat> uh, the institution's role is to create uh, an accomplished ICT environment for the teachers and students <clears throat> to work, maximizing the possibilities of technology combined with creativity and scholarship of teachers. A digital technology enablement uh, is important because it immediately brings the students and teachers as part of the learning teaching communities the world over. Now it's very important. UGC <coughs> is pushing blended teaching, blended learning, and the, the system of academic bank of credits, as already mentioned by the principal, facilitating global as well as national mobility of students as freelancers doing courses and shopping credits from university to university. It allows multiple entry and exit in higher education institutions. Students can take an account in the academic bank, deposit, accumulate, transfer, and enjoy redemption of their credits. It's anytime learning, anywhere learning, and any level learning, very flexible and totally free of rigid restrictions of institutions. The government is taking steps to make necessary amendments in the acts and statutes of the universities. We have to see that the higher education institutions are becoming increasingly autonomous. Now, the situation demands that the, student, the students have to be more responsible. They have to be self-directed, curiosity-driven, personalized learners. And teachers are expected to facilitate the process. Students have to realize that they are basically self learners, guided, not controlled by institutions and teachers. It is very important to enable each institution technologically to render this environment plausible for students. So in this connection, we thought that <clears throat> the institutions must be given server space centrally located as a resource frugal program. So in collaboration with the Digital University, we have this program of organizing the entire higher education institutions in the state in one site with enough server space with the facility for every college to have its own dashboard to operate their learning management system 
with privacy. Learning management system, as you all know, is a reliable record of teaching and learning, which provides actual evidence of the user's creative abilities and achievement. And it is going to be one of the very open and transparent platforms for evaluating the students as well as teachers. Now, how to provide each college this facility easily, quickly, and with relatively less expenditure has been our interest. Accordingly, we have now started training the teachers and institutions as a whole for operating the system that the State Higher Education Council is planning to offer. And with the help of the Digital University, we will set up a centralized cloud space and create instances providing for each college to operate their each college to operate its learning management system. Now we are planning to provide a place in the Docker container of the virtual machine setup we have started building up. And there would be several colleges in, in one Docker container. And the college will be able to operate the, the system. And that's the reason why we are offering college-wise training and it's in progress. Now, once the college completes the training, it has to declare the digital policy and then see that even the guest lecturers comply with the meanings, measures and parameters of the digitally enabled teaching learning. Now, now let me briefly mention the, the responsibilities here. Each college will undertake the responsibility of running the teaching learning uh, as the learning management system requires. And each college principal would see that the institution is running accordingly. A group, preferably the IQSE members, would equip themselves to attend to the troubleshooting of the institution's Docker container space. Now it's the responsibility of the universities to see that the curriculum is customized to the LMS. Now we all know that it is time for us to go with the technology of the time. We all know that there is this major problem of digital divide, but there is no point in waiting for the state to adopt a statewide scheme for overcoming this. It has to be attended to at the decentralized level with the help of leaders of altruistic temperament, various industries, 
self governing institutions and and so on in addition to all of us who constitute the academic community it's anyway an unavoidable move wherein we cannot wait saying that we have many who are not able to march ahead it's like an emergency situation a house on fire like situation where you have to flee with your people and belongings Now those who are aged and disabled will have to be carried by us the children will be carried and in that kind of a mood we have to move it's like a situation of people lost in an island with the only source of escape a ship under construction but the captain is ready to set out and then it is our responsibility to rush to the ship under construction and helping the construction and sail so we are almost in that kind of a situation we cannot wait until everything is set we have to board the ship under construction but ready to set out now i wish the organizers all the best and i appreciate the teachers who have shown great interest in participating in the faculty development program which is not uh in the in the previous style that used to be updating workshops updating workshops in which some would listen and some would think what they would like so most of the workshops however intense they could be used to fail but now i am experiencing a different kind of workshop all over teachers take great interest in making themselves equipped because workshops are all digital technology based hands on training workshops the resource persons are enjoying and participants are enjoying because at both ends you have people exploring and learning new avenues you don't find that kind of resource persons in any other area that kind of students participants in any other field so it's a very important thing that teachers have taken up the responsibility of making themselves technologically fit to be teachers a technology has always been assisting teaching unfortunately we sometimes lagged in this just as at the initial phase of the inception of the blackboard many teachers refused to use it many traditional teachers didn't want to use it but for some time it happened to be the central instrument of knowledge transmission in the classroom now after some time once again blackboard happened to be important only for teachers of physics mathematics and perhaps sometimes the biology teachers others withdrew from the blackboard and without any tools teachers have been just lecturing i know 
history teachers teaching geographical explorations without using map nobody will be able to teach the history of geographical explorations without a world map but you know that kind of self alienated mechanical teaching used to be part of our system that accounted for the abysmally poor academic performance of the university sent colleges now it is important that teachers come up with the technology enabled pedagogy but remember that this is not sidelining teachers the technology as such is not an effective instrument and never a substitute for teacher without teachers technology wouldn't do any good you need not ordinary teachers but teachers converted into mavericks you need maverick professors maverick teachers to control technology technology is like a horse and somebody who can mount the horse will be able to guide it properly like that you need maverick teachers horse mount running technology effectively and there is a there, there is a vast body of knowledge and skill available in the domain of a uh, techno pedagogy less efficient techno pedagogy people capable of using the inevitable e portfolios for teaching ensuring that students are graduating to analytical understanding a procedural understanding it's not just at the level of by root learning but systematic learning not merely remembering things but understanding conceptually procedurally and then acquiring faculty faculty to apply faculty to analyze faculty to evaluate and faculty to create so these cognitive levels must be in mind for teachers and the the whole process called outcome based education is in place now we all thought that bloom's taxonomy was outdated now we need a template anyway but very original teachers wouldn't require it but once we have determined to massify education democratize higher education then you need a template to ensure that students are able to improve stage by stage across the cognitive levels now for that you have a very effective techno uh, pedagogic uh, system now and you have to be proficient in that and i'm sure that workshops like this will help you transform yourself into maverick professors maverick teachers using the available technology effectively and students much more effectively making use of the techno pedagogic e portfolios for making themselves accomplished students now wishing you all the best i inaugurate your international faculty development program thank you thank you sir thank you so much for joining here with us despite your busy schedule and thank you for inaugurating the program it was a delight to hear from you thank you so much
And now, uh, let me now invite Mr. M. Muhammad, the chairman of the College Management Committee, to address the gathering. Please, sir. Yes, Dr. Mansoor, I'm glad to join you on this uh, wonderful program. And I'm pleased to really hear from the chief guest a really constructive, informative speech. And uh, I'm really glad that he has compared this program with a horse and the horse trainer. And fortunately, Marambali College has got both the horse that yeah. infrastructure and the rider that's a good uh, teaching staff and the faculty. And I'm sure the combination of both as narrated by the chief guest will really take this program to its uh, logical conclusions. And I wish the function all the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your continuous support for all of the programs. Thank you so much. And now I would like to invite Advocate A.A. A. Abul Hassan, Secretary of College Management Committee, to address the gathering. Please, sir. Very good morning to you all, respected principal, <laughs> respected Rajan Gurkar, sir, respected Murali Tumar Gudi, sir, our chairman. M.M. Mohammed Sahib, Dr. Jasmine, and the entire team of IQAC, and the participant teachers and students. This weekend, we had a very happy news that schools and colleges are going to be open, be open after one and a half years. We never imagined that institutions will be kept closed for such a long time. Everything happened beyond our imagination, not only in schools and colleges, but even in our daily life. We cannot go out without a mask. That is the order of the day. Almost all the people have taken it very seriously. And uh, I am happy that the campus is going to be live again. And uh, our students will uh, uh, brighten the campus, I am sure. One thing I am to, I am to say, that initially we started these webinars, which we, many, of them, many of us did not take it very seriously. But now it has part of the day and part of our daily affairs of extending knowledge from one person to other or from one person to groups. And uh, even after reopening the colleges and uh, schools, I'm, I'm sure that we have to continue with these webinars and international seminars so that the faculty improvement development program and similar other uh, uh, matters can be again kept live so that the knowledge tanks na available nationally and internationally will be available in our campus online. I am happy that such a very fine international seminar is organized for faculty development program and uh, our teachers will enrich their knowledge by this uh, program. And that will be transmitted to our students for better performance in their life. Thank you very much. I wish all the best to this webinar. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your support for all of the programs. Thank you so much for being here with us. And now I would like to invite Ms. Jasmine and now I would like to invite Dr. Jasmine, Assistant Professor, Department of MHRM, to introduce the resource person. Please, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are. Respected Principal Dr. Mansur Ali, sir, members of the management committee, respected, most respected resource person for today, Dr. Murali Tumarikudi, sir, other uh, members of many institutions, the person who now greeted uh, Dr. Rajan Gurukal, sir, IQAC coordinator, Dr. Jasmine Miss, other IQAC members and dear faculty members. A very good morning to you all. We know that the whole world is passing through a period of crisis now. There has been a paradigm shift 
in uh, teaching learning process. With the help of ICT technologies, uh, we are coming, we have come so far in the teaching learning. The internal quality assurance cell of uh, MES College Marambali is keen to promote and assure quality in all aspects of teaching and learning. In this context, IQAC MES College Marambali under the UGC Paramash scheme in association with the Kerala State Higher Education Council is conducting this one week online international FDP on the topic fostering digital core competencies in academic landscape. Various topics will be covered in the coming seven days. And today's topic is internationalization of education. We are indeed blessed and privileged to have with us Dr. Murali Tumarikudi, sir, as the resource person for today's topic. Before we start with the session, a few words on Dr. Murali Tumarikudi and the topic. Dr. Murali is currently the operations manager at the crisis management branch of United Nations Environment Program. He holds a PhD in environmental engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. He is an alumnus of International Leadership Academy and also attended University of California, Berkeley for the Beavers Environmental Leadership Program. Between 1995 to 2003, Dr. Murali was corporate advisor to Shell operated oil companies in Brunei and Oman. Since joining the UN Environment in 2003, Dr. Murali has been involved in dealing with crisis responses in all major disasters and conflicts in this century. With more than 25 years of international experience in the field of environmental management in crisis situations, Mr. Murli is one of the world's leading authorities on this topic and frequently lectures in universities around the world on the topic. He has published several books and written articles in leading Malayalam dailies as well. Dr. Murli is also the winner of Kerala Sahitya Academy Awards 2018 for humorous literature. He has written a number of books in Malayalam too, Dr. Murali has also served as the resource person for many sessions on teaching learning aspects, especially digitalization of education. So we have indeed the right person here with us to deliver the talk on internationalization of education. Before we start, I'll just give a brief introduction to the topic. That's when you are mute. <laughs> Sorry, sorry for the inconvenience. Internationalization of education is viewed through different perspectives. It includes the academic mobility of students and teachers across borders, international linkages, partnerships and projects, new international academic programs, research initiatives, etc. It also involves delivery of education through new types of arrangements such as branch campuses or franchises and using a variety of face to face phase and distance learning techniques. It also means the integration of an international, intercultural and global dimension into the curriculum and teaching learning process. Even commercial trade of higher education services is treated as internationalization. Coming to the internationalization of uh, education in India, we do have a rich cultural heritage with many, uh, the history of uh, very famous universities like Nalanda and uh, uh, Takshashila, yet there exists a gap, gap with regard to internationalization of education. So uh, to deliver a talk on this, we, have, we are blessed and privileged to have Dr. Murali Tumarudi sir with us. So with utmost gratitude and pride, I invite you sir to deliver the session. Please sir. Thank you, Jasmine. <clears throat> I respect our principal, members of the management committee. Um, dear faculty members, it is um, early morning here in Geneva, but it is indeed a pleasure to have this opportunity to talk to more than 200 faculty members from Kerala. I am very happy to learn that you are talking about the new type of education, digitalization of education, and I would actually talk about internationalization of education. In fact, 
this is not the first time that I am talking to faculty members in Kerala about internationalization of education. In 2015, when Ambassador T.P. Srinivasan was the chairman of the executive vice chairman of the Kerala Higher Education Council, I worked with him to organize an international workshop on transnational education. We had all the vice chancellors of the state. We had the principals of 101 A grade colleges in Kerala. And we tried telling them about how the world of education is going to change. How massive open online courses would became would become the normal way of teaching. It was not an easy message. We come out with what we call a Trivandrum Declaration on International Education. Those of you who are interested should go to the web, go to the website or Google for this document. The proceedings of the international meet on transnational education and attached to it is a Trivandrum declaration. It came out in January 2015. And if you read that, you would actually be surprised as well as shocked as to how futuristic that document was. We recommended in 2015 that online education is going to be the norm in the future, that all faculty members should be encouraged to offer at least one online course. We recommended in 2015 that all students should be encouraged to take online classes as part of their curriculum. We encouraged all colleges and universities should set up studios for online education because that is going to be the future. Obviously, like many workshops and seminars which we conduct, this did not go anywhere. Maybe 1% of the people who took up ideas which we mentioned, but 99% of the people who are extremely comfortable with the way of teaching and learning, which we have been doing. And then came COVID. And that upset everything. In March, 2020, the world went into COVID. All the 193 member states of the United Nations were affected. Education of 1.6 billion students came to a standstill in every country, probably except Sweden. And it still have not recovered in most countries. In Kerala, I'm very happy that in a month, things will start to get normal. In Switzerland, it's near normal, but in many parts of the world, it is still not normal. But as the world plunged into COVID and students had no way of learning, suddenly things started to change. Arun Shauri make this very interesting observation. In India, breakthroughs often happen during breakdowns. That should not be the case, but that is often the case. And this has been the case for online education as well. That it took COVID to shake the academic community, teachers, students, institutions, to understand the opportunity of online 
education. Along with COVID came the new education policy. First policy after, I think, 36 years. Even though the education policy is called new, and even though most of the stuff which is in that education policy are new to India, most recommendations are actually already international best practices for at least 30 years. So it would have been a fantastic policy if it had come in the 1990s. For example, the current policy gives the opportunity of portable credits, credit which can be taken from one university to another. This started in Europe, in the 1990s, as part of what is now called the Bologna process. You can study in any university in most of Europe and some universities outside as well. I think 46 countries are part of the Bologna Pact. You can start a BSc degree in physics in the University of Geneva. Six months later, you can move to another university in Zurich in Switzerland and continue to study. And maybe after six months, you can go to university in France or Spain or Finland or England and continue your study. But not only, you can continue your study not only in physics, you could continue to study or you can shift your focus of your study to drama, to literature, to music, to medicine. So all these things were already possible in 1990s. And these things are now coming as a part of the new education policy. The National Academic Bank of Credit, which Rajan Gurukul sir mentioned, and I'm sure all of you are familiar, will start to provide these opportunities. But we are not there yet. Kerala now have about 23 universities when I counted last, including central universities, including what is deemed to be universities. But not only that, we can shift from one university in Kerala to another, forget about going from one state to another, even moving from one college in one university to another college, the same university to study the same topic is a nightmare. This needs tremendous amount of influence, support, and often lead to controversy. So it is from this extremely low background, extremely low baseline, where we are forcing ourselves and our students to study a very narrow set of courses, exactly the way we have prescribed it, at a place and time where we have prescribed it, that we are talking about internationalization of education. But that is going to be the way. I often say that our education is like a Malayali sadhya. Someone have already decided the menu. There's a banana leaf put in front of you. All the dish is already served. So it's a certain quantity of rice. You are expected to finish it all. If you do not, you do not get a degree. Whether you like Ericeri or Puliceri, you must eat it. If you don't like, you have the freedom to walk out, but then you get no sadhya. This is not in the best spirit of education. And that's not how the future of education is going to be. Future of education is going to be a buffet where things are available on the shelf and the student pick up what they want. The teachers, would be able to gain them. And that is where international best practice is now 
And that is what international education is going to do to our academics. There is one more global trend which will force internationalization of education. And I will talk about that before I go to explain how that's going to manifest in our colleges and universities. And I must say that my style of presentation is not going to continue to speak to you till the end of my session. And I would actually stop at seven as a plan at seven my time, which is about in 26 minutes. So I do expect the teachers to have some questions. So I would leave about 10, 15 minutes for that. So please be prepared with some questions so that we can have some interaction. The third trend, in addition to COVID, in addition to the new education policy, which will transform our education is the fourth industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution, as you know, came with steam engine. The second industrial revolution came with electricity. The third industrial revolution came with internet. And the fourth industrial revolution is around us with artificial intelligence. And there are many other technologies which goes with it. Internet of things, 5G, robotics, and changes in biology. But all this is going to change the world so much that Oxford University in its landmark study called the future of employment said that 46% of our existing jobs would cease to exist by 2030. That's in less than 10 years time. Half of the jobs as we know now would cease to exist. And when the report came out in 2013, Nobody believed this. I did not believe it myself when I read it first. But as you have seen during COVID, millions of jobs just vanished. Of the 3.2 billion people who work, international labor organization estimate that 300 million jobs vanish and are not going to come back. The job of People in retail is what you saw mostly, but job of a driver is something that's going to vanish. The, the job of teachers are going to, not, the job of doctors are going to be changed dramatically. The job of ship captains, the job of pilot. There are hundreds of type of jobs, not jobs, type of jobs which would vanish. And the new education will have to prepare for two things. One, is to prepare people with the new skills needed for jobs in the fourth industrial revolution. But the jobs will also keep changing. And therefore, education will be lifelong. The type of time when we studied something and then with that, education, you had a lifelong career is over. What you will do, what you will have to do is to be constantly updated about new topics happening, new skills. And again and again, it may not happen to you as faculty, but the students whom you are teaching will not have the pleasure of being in one career through their lifetime. At least two, probably three careers in their lifetime is going to be the norm for those who are entering education now. So it is in this context of a post-COVID situation, a new national education policy, the fourth industrial revolution that we ought to see internationalization of education. As Jasmine mentioned, there are many elements to it. In 2015, as we were discussing transnational education, one dominant idea 
was that of international campuses coming to India. That's a big point of debate at that time. It is no longer such a big debate. There has been such attempts in Dubai, in Malaysia, in Singapore, there are international campuses of globally famous universities. And the idea was that such things could happen in India as well. So far it hasn't happened. It may happen, but online education has made that question redundant. Harvard University, if they wish to teach students in India, no longer have to come to India, can be taught from Harvard. Many students in 2020 studied in the universities in Germany, UK, Finland, Sweden, US, sitting in their bedroom in Kerala villages and graduated. So it is no longer the, the physical movement of infrastructure is no longer necessary. The second point is a sandwich program where students study partly in India and partly abroad. I think this is going to be on the rise. What is going to happen as much as online education is very interesting and innovative. Education is not just about imparting knowledge. It's also about forming networks. And often in your career, what really push you ahead in your career is not so much as to what you learned, but who you have met in your graduate studies. If you study economics, and if you go to a local college in Kerala, or to Madras School of Economics, or to Oxford, or to Harvard, you will study the same economics. The economics don't change. But when you graduate, you will come out with a tremendously different career potential. Probably a gap in the economic prospect of 100 times between somebody who studied in Kerala and someone who graduated from Harvard. Part of it ex is explained by the GDP of the country, but part of it's also explained by the reputation of the institution as you come out. And the reputation of the institution come out also from the quality of students who enter to study there. So sandwich ed education, which will give you international exposure and network is certainly going to be more and more. A third part of international education is the mobility of faculty across borders. And this, of course, has already happened. In the past, when we proposed this, there are many constraints straight to this situation. If an international faculty from Oxford or Harvard actually had to come and teach a course in Kerala University or Mahatma Gandhi University, there are many, many, many hurdles to close, to cross. Getting a visa, for example, almost impossible. A working visa in India for someone international. But that's no longer the case. With COVID demonstrating that you can work from home, with COVID demonstrating that you can teach from anywhere, you could now have faculty members from anywhere teaching in any institution anywhere in the world. So long as there is internet, that becomes possible. So mobility of faculty is now going to be absolutely common. Now, I hope legal framework would be updated so that those who are teaching online can also teach in the classroom without constraints of visa. Now, the future of education is not going to be in the conventional universities and classrooms as we are happening now. 
India, Kerala, as I mentioned, has 23 universities and deemed to be universities, central universities, IIT included. India probably has about 1,000 of them. The world put together probably has 10,000 universities. And in every university and every college, and in, in Kerala, we have, of course, the system of affiliated colleges. Universities is mostly a examination conducting institution, not a teaching or research institution. So there are, I think there are 40,000 teaching, higher education teaching places in India. This is what I read in the national education policy. And in 40,000 colleges, there may be someone teaching English. 40,000, 30,000 colleges, someone is teaching economics. All teachers are trying to do their best, but not all are the best teachers. And I have experience when I was doing engineering that we had a topic called engineering drawing. And we had three teachers teaching. It was mandatory for every engineering student. It still is, I think. And when we had a certain teacher, Rajendran sir, teach that topic, 80% of the class would pass. But when we had other teachers, only 40% would pass because it was one of the most difficult topic. It still is. But Rajendran sir could only teach just 60 students in one class. He could not teach all the 240 students who came for the first year. So the quality of education you received was constrained by the physical boundaries. It has always been in history, but that's no longer the case. You could, this faculty development program, I see more, have more than 200 people. At the start of COVID, I was invited to do a faculty development program in Palakkad Engineering College. And I asked how many students are, how many faculty is coming? And they said there are 30. So I said, why 30? Why not half 300? Because they were still in the old mindset that, okay, 30 teachers all coming to place. We had at the start of COVID planned a training. The UN had planned a training in Delhi for 30 people. So when COVID came, we decided to convert that online. And we were decided to make it global. So from 30 students, we had 5,600 students from 183 countries. And this is what international Association of education is going to be. That the best of the teachers and the best of the courses will have demand all over the world. All of you would know about Coursera. This is one of the online institutions established only in 2012. It now have more than 70 million learners, 70 million learners. You take Oxford University established close to 1,000 years ago. It, on an average, have 25,000 students. Now, if you assume the same number of students in the last 1,000 years, which is not the case, but still, if you assume, it will still have less learners passing through Oxford than has passed through Coursera in the last 10 years. I mentioned about Rajinder and Sir teaching only 40 students. There is one professor in Yale University called Dr. Laura Santos, who teaches a course called Science of Well-Being. If you have not seen it, I encourage all of you to take it. It's about what defines success. Extremely illustrative philosophical course. She used to teach to about 20, 25 undergraduate students in the Yale University. But somebody decided to lecture her course. This was not designed as a MOOC. Somebody decided to lecture her course as she sat in her, what appeared to be her sitting room and talking to 
15, 20 students sitting in their sofa, which was the way she conducted the class. The last time I checked, there are 3.2 million students who have learned that course, 3.2 million students. Even if you assume only 10% of them have actually completed the course, which is typical of MOOC, you are still talking about 300,000 students who have completed the course. Imagine the Laura Centers trying to teach to 20 students, two semesters a year, maybe three, and then multiply that by 30, 40 years of her academic life. How many students it would have reached? 3,000, and it's from 3,000, it has gone to 300,000. This is the power of internationalization of education. But what it is going to do is something which you should know. I told you about the change in employment the fourth industrial revolution is going to do. The change in teaching world, which is going to happen, is going to be absolutely exciting, but also shocking at a very personal level. The role of 3,000 economic teachers or 30,000 science teachers and English teachers is over. You will not need 40,000 teachers to teach English in 40,000 colleges in Kerala. You will have the best of the teachers from Oxford and Harvard and Cambridge, native speakers, who would be able to speak, speak, teach English much better than what we can do. It's not because we are bad teachers. That's because that's not our land. You'll have the best teachers of physics from our colleges, maybe teaching the world. We'll be able to teach Malayalam to 3 million people around the world. So the number of people who actually need as teachers would shrink to minority, but not only. The best teachers would be the teachers who understand the new technology better. I wouldn't be surprised that teaching acts become an act of performance. I'm not saying that's the right thing, but I'm saying that's likely to be the case. That somebody who has command of the online space, of the screen, would start to teach and they would start to command tremendous premium. There would be million dollar teachers because they are able to teach courses which are taken by 3 million people. Then the question is that, will there be 10,000 universities around the world? Will there be 100,000 teachers when you have one teacher who is able to teach 3 million students? The answer is no, you will not. But the need for teaching facilitators would explode. What teachers would have to do is to move from agents who transfer knowledge to agents who facilitate learning of students. And it is this conversion you have to make in the internationalization of education. The 10,000 universities will shrink. As you know, there's only one Facebook, one WhatsApp. The way the, the world in which there are very few universities in the world is perceivable. Even now we do not have universities which has high rank. So somebody, some student in India, some student in, in our village, actually wanting to go to some of the best known un university brand in the world is completely understandable. But even those universities would change. I can imagine a world where someone like Coursera would decide to buy one of the well-known universities. There are universities in many parts of the world are private universities. And as you know, even in India, public sector units are actually being sold to private sector. You can think of a world in which Universities with tremendous brand are literally taken over by this online giants and their teaching curriculum is enriched by the faculty. The faculty in these super universities would become the benchmark for international education. And those courses delivered by somebody who has the command of presence of the 
of the screen would teach to millions of students around the world. And the classrooms will become a flipped classroom where the role of the teacher in all the 10,000, in all the 40,000 teaching places in India would become that of a facilitator. You can also imagine a world where, because people will have to come back to university again and again, a classroom, the average age of the classroom now, it is less than 25, would start to move up because people who are 40, 50, 60 will have to come back to classrooms again. And classrooms will not be something which works from nine to five. Classrooms would be something which is 24 seven because it happens around the world. So colleges will have to change dramatically and drastically in this new world of globalization. And the question is, are we ready? Are we ready emotionally? Are we ready financially? Or will we try to fight internationalization of education? We could, I don't think we will win. I think the explosive growth of online education, the internationalization of curriculum, the removal of barriers in academics have all happened and they are not going to come back to class. I would stop at this point and I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thumarugudi. It's indeed, uh, we can understand that uh, uh, you are, you know, there it is uh, early morning and immediately we rang, you know, you took the phone call, you, you know, immediately consented to uh, have, you know, to participate and uh, to uh, share your views on international, internationalization of education. And of course, you are mentioning, uh, you know, about the uh, Sadhya of Kerala with the kind of education we are giving. And of course, if you don't want to share your Navi, uh, we don't want to take up that. And of course, uh, in National Education Policy 2020, they have come up with the idea, uh, international branch campuses. So uh, what's your thought as, you know, I'm also optimistic as, you know, you concluded with optimism, whether we want to take up or not that. And of course, when it comes to Kerala particularly, you can see that, if you are looking into Andhra Pradesh, already Kriya University established in Haryana, there is Ashoka University, and uh, there are, you know, very high profile professors are teaching there. And uh, Raghuram Rajan is heading the Kriya University. And what's your take on Kerala on that and when it is going to happen? And that's the questions I'm having in my mind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so I, I see there are a lot of questions coming in the chat room now. Um, as you may have read, later today, I actually have to see, you know, I have a training program for the old cabinet of Kerala, so I have to leave um, as planned in about five minutes. So I will answer your question and I'll take one more question and then with deep regret, I will I have to leave. Um, in Kerala, a private university, I think, um, very unlikely in the immediate future because of ideological reason. I think um, we are not yet ready for that. It is happening and it is changing students' pers perspective. But what's happening, as you can see, some of our best students are actually going to the Ashoka University. Some of our best students are all going outside Kerala. I'm actually recommending students to take up liberal arts outside Kerala, because that's actually going to give them a better career than doing computer science in Toronto Engineering College or even IITs, because that's where the world is going. The question is, what can our faculty do? There are two levels. At one level, and this is very likely to happen as, a, as an organizational level, the instinct will be to try to prevent these things from happening because you know that may affect employment security it may affect benefit it may also have affect the way of doing things 
So as a, you know, if you are a member of a Kerala private college teaching association or something, your instinct will be to, to resist it. And that I leave apart. But when I project into future, what I see is a world of tremendous opportunities for the faculty. That you are no longer constrained by, or you will be no longer constrained by the curriculum, which is sometimes very old, <clears throat> the teaching methods, which are very old, the teaching timings, which are odd. So th there is a lot of freedom and flexibility coming your way. <clears throat> so just embrace the freedom and flexibility because this is an opportunity of a lifetime that education is changing in a way which you never imagined it should change. This is what I said, what Arun Sherry said. We had a breakdown, now we are having a breakthrough. So master this, master the new technology and try to be facilitators of knowledge. Understand what is happening around the world. Understand the fourth industrial revolution. Understand mentoring. How do we mentor? When a student comes, every student is different. Every student is valuable. Every student is different. It is not to put them through a standard course and whether make them pass or fail is the duty of the teacher. The duty of the teacher is to make each one of the students in the classroom achieve their potential, which include actually telling them that probably continuing with your English education is not a good idea. Not even half of the students who join for medicine in Switzerland would graduate. And then not even half. I was told in France is even less. So it is also a role of a good teacher, not just to push people to complete a course which they don't like, it's, they're unlikely to be useful to the society. But instead tell them that this is probably not what they should be doing and direct them to something more meaningful. With everyone getting A plus, and this is called grade inflation, it is very difficult for anybody, parents, students themselves to judge them as to how good they are to do something in the past, if you got you know, good marks in mathematics, you went for engineering, good marks in biology, you went for medicine and you know, et cetera. But now everyone seems to be good at everything, which I think is a stat statistical artifact than a quantum gem, in the quality of the students. So it is also the role of the teachers to take up this mentoring task, evaluating students' potential continuously and give them. And the academic bank of credit, give that flexibility that students who studied, started studying in English or in biology can shift to another topic after spending a year or two and without losing the subjects which they studied and excelled. This is how education is already happening internationally. So teachers should understand these possibilities, turn into mentors, use the teaching material best from the world, and try to create a generation which is fit for the fourth industrial revolution. I will not stop now. I thank all of you for joining this session and asking many, many interesting questions. I wish I could stay longer. But unfortunately, because I have another one coming up, I will have to leave now. Thank you, Manso. Thank you, um, Jasmine. And uh, thank you all the uh, faculty uh, members who joined and also the management committee. Thank you. Th thank you so much. We will uh, collaborate, you know, all the questions and we will send you in person and later we can, you know, give the answers to the participants. That will be a good idea. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Murli, sir, for the extensive and detailed session. It was really wonderful and informative.
uh, on behalf of MES College Marambali, IQAC, and all others, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, and thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, actually, we had a slight change in our program schedule due to the busy timings of a resource person. Pardon that, and also he couldn't answer some of your questions. We're extremely sorry about that, too. But we assure you that we will send uh, all your queries and questions to Dr. Mukhita Markuri, and we will inform you. So we assure you that. And uh, now let's continue with the felicitations. So, uh, and now I would like to invite Ms. Lina C. Shekhar, Staff Secretary and Associate Professor of MES College, Madam Bradley, to proceed the felicitation. Please, ma'am. Thank you, Sarva. Respected dignitaries, participants from various institutions, my dear colleagues and friends, Warm good morning to one and all. First of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the organizers for giving me an opportunity to say a few words in this occasion. Being a former member of IQSC team, I'm really very happy to be here with you all. As we all know, the digital competence that has become a key concept in the discussion of what kind of skills we should have in the knowledge society in recent years. The digital competence that is one of the most recent concepts describing technology related skills and the digitization of society produces a need to foster new skills and competencies in learners. The use of technology to support teaching and to maximize the learning experience is a key drive for significant changes in the educational landscape. The COVID-19 emergency created several problems and challenges for educational institutions, forcing them quickly to learn the different methods of conducting technology and enhanced learning. The continuous and increasing digitization in society as well as changes in technology itself results in significant changes in academic landscape and its policies. As our chief guest, Ajahn Gurukul Sausage, the students have to realize that they are self-learners guided by the teachers. And also the teachers has to take the responsibility of making them fit for the situation by themselves. And our college, is organizing various FDPs for fostering the teaching community. Last week also, we had one FDP on effective course delivery through Moodle, a learning management system organized by the Department of Computer Applications, which was sponsored by the AACT. I really take this opportunity to congratulate the entire team of IQSC, especially the coordinators for arranging this six-day international FDP under UGC Parama scheme in association with the Higher Education Council on fostering digital core competencies in academic landscape. We already had one session on the topic internationalization of education. And very well, he explained the concept behind that. He also said, we have to make the student fit for the digital era. So I wish all the success for this program and let the coming six days be very fruitful to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Now I would like to inform the participants that the feedback form is given in the chat box. So please do take your time and give your remarks about the program. Thank you. So let me now invite Ms. Zafira Shamsuddin, the program coordinator, to propose a vote of thanks. Please, ma'am. Respected Principal, Dr. Mansoor Ali Pipi, Honorable Chief Guest, Dr. Rajan Gurukal, Vice Chairman of Kerala State Higher Education Council, uh, today's eminent speaker, Dr. Murali Tumarakudi, Operations Manager, Crisis Management Branch, UN Environment, Most Respected Mr. M.A. Muhammad, Chairman, College Managing Committee, Advocate A.A. Abul Hassan, Secretary, College Managing Committee, Respected Standing Committee Members of Paramarsh, Ms. Lena Sishega, Staff Secretary, Dr. Jasmine P.M., convener of this FDP and IQSC coordinator, Ms. Indu Susan, 
Ms. Minu Mohammed, Ms. Bhavya Manon, coordinators of the program, all IQSC members, my colleagues and participants. Good morning, all of you. We have assembled here for the inaugural session of the One Week Online International Faculty Development Program under UGC Paramarsha Scheme in association with Kerala State Higher Education Council on fostering digital core competency in academic landscape. Motivation behind this program is to enrich the educators to master the digital platforms used widely in the education sector. This COVID-19 pandemic forced us to stick on to the digital environment. Here comes the importance of our FDP, which equips each and every educator to foster digital competency in the academic landscape. In this occasion, it is my pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks for this event to all the dignitaries assembled here. First of all, I would like to thank our beloved principal, Dr. Mansur Ali Pipi, who is the motivation and guiding star for us. We are honored to have you, you with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. On behalf of the NTR Institute, I would like to thank the Honorable Chief Guest, Dr. Rajan Purikal, Vice Chairman, Kerala State Higher Education Council, who took out his valuable time and joined us today to be a part of this inaugural function. Thank you, sir. A special word of thanks to today's speaker, Dr. Murali Tumarakudi, Operations Manager, Crisis Management Bank, UN Environment, for receiving our invitation and giving a wonderful explanation about internationalization of education system. Thank you, sir. I take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to all the standing committee members of Paramarsh for supporting us. I would like to thank the most respected chairman, Mr. M.A. Muhammad, Secretary Advocate A.A. Abul Hassan, who have blessed us with their presence. Thank you. I would like to thank Ms. Lena C. Shager, Staff Secretary, who shower a more inspiring words, and we, the IQC team, are motivated more. Thank you, ma'am. I express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Jasmine P.M., convener of the program and IQC coordinator who is the brain behind this FDP for the wholehearted support given to us throughout the program. Thank you, ma'am. I am fortunate to thank the dedicated and well-motivated IQC team of our college, whose sincere hard work made this FDP a grand success. Thank you all. I would also like to thank Selva, who had done an excellent anchoring here, and Mr. Salil, Mr. Joy for the technical support. The strength and success of a program relies on the participants. So I thank all the part participants from the bottom of my heart. Have a great day. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. So that's all about it today. We are wrapping up. So hope you all had a very fruitful session today. We are adjourning today's session. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. So see you all tomorrow for the second session with a brand new topic. And uh, do join us tomorrow at 3.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time in the same platform. So see you all tomorrow. Till then, goodbye and stay safe. Thank you so much.